Hello. Welcome. We are the three intern ministers at Community Church of New York in Manhattan. We three interns are Unitarian Universalists in the process of becoming ordained clergy. In this podcast, we delve into the life of an intern minister. We explore the ways our lives and internships intersect and how this is ministerial formation. I'm Megan Henry. I'm Anthony Cruz. I'm Carrie McAvoy. And we're... Ready Ready now. now! Hi, Megan. Hey, Carrie. Welcome back. Welcome back, all you watchers and listeners and watchers and listeners to our fourth episode of Revving Up. Anthony couldn't join us today, but Moxie the cat is here with Megan. She she sure is. And If we're we're lucky, she'll actually meow. Something to look forward to beyond our discussion today that's exciting. Our listener and watcher, Alan, uh, specifically questioned us about Unitarian Universalist celebration of holidays and seasons and things like that. So we thought that would be a great topic for today's episode, which is in the midst of of, um, Easter and Passover and Lent. And um, so we just thought it would be great to take the chance to talk about what these holidays are and in a celebrated in a UU tradition. And also as a jumping off point to talk about other like UU specific holidays and seasonal changes and all of that. That's right. We have, um, there's so much variety in UU communities. Um, and sorry for all of those who are like, you, you, why do they keep saying that? It's because what that's short for Unitarian Universalist and it gets a little bit wordy, um, after a while. So when we say you, you, we mean Unitarian Universalists. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, the variety that comes in you, you communities in terms of how folks celebrate holidays, especially holidays that are traditionally celebrated in the United States as um, either secular or Christian holidays. And also Jewish holidays tend to be often recognized in many UU communities where there are, if there are uh, large um, memberships coming from a Jewish background or even currently practicing Judaism, which is another whole nother topic for (laughs) another episode yeah it's a unitarian universalist has those who are raised in the faith like yourself megan but also it's um tends to attract people who have grown up in some kind of religious tradition and uh didn't it didn't resonate with them like myself coming from a catholic background or uh, it doesn't fit their theology, or it's done harm to them because mm-hmm. of certain identities they hold, mm-hmm. or just human fallibility, or ideologies, or or things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Carrie, I would love to dive into talking a little bit about this time of year. Right now, we're in the spring. Mm-hmm. We've had the spring equinox. We've had our first day of spring. We've also um, here in where we are located in New York City and Connecticut on the East Coast, we've had our whole uh, daylight savings time change. um, And that impacts uh, us in terms of the how much daylight there is. And so we are in the midst of this seasonal celebration of spring. And there are a lot of different ways that you use do celebrate spring. What are some of the ways that you're kind of seeing come up in your communities, Carrie? So, um, well, Easter and and uh, Christmas are always fairly large um, worship experiences in the UU congregations that I've been involved with. 
but it's always kind of problematic. It's like, well, as you use, how do we talk about, I mean, both of those holidays are very uh, Jesus centered, um, Easter being the memory of Jesus's death and resurrection and Christmas celebrating his birth. Um, and so I, I think I, I've heard, I've talked to other ministers who have really s struggled with how to kind of find the themes that resonate in a EU uh, context, but also honor its origins or at least remember the origins and also um, just address people's need to find a meaningful way to celebrate these holidays that sometimes are very, very entrenched in their religion of origin, as well as um, are so prevalent in the society in general. So uh, Easter, for instance, there's very resonant themes around spring, around rebirth, um, around death and life cycle and um, honoring the memory of a really important person who had a lot of things to say. Uh, so it's the, the actual celebrations themselves tend to vary from year to year, but um, they, are, they are important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And just to um, ground us in our UU sources, we, one of our sources says, that we um, that Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves, is one of our sources. And um, although many um, United Statesian Unitarian Universalists tend to shy away from um, thinking about the, the the this fact, Unitarians and Universalists, um, you know, our origins are Christian. So it may be a heretical Christianity, but it's still Christian. And so like, for instance, um, a church that I serve in Brooklyn, New York, as the director of education and family ministry, First Unitarian Congregational Society of Brooklyn is a congregational society specifically because there are many Jewish members who are not um, comfortable with the terminology of calling it a church. Now it's a super churchy building. It's a neo-Gothic revival or something like that. I mean, it's literally like, looks like a Gothic church. Um, and it has stained glass windows. Um, and there are stained glass windows of Unitarian and Universalists up high in the um, very top that were added later. So there are, you know, it's just really, it's, it's just, it's just really interesting. And the church was uh, a church of the savior started as a unitarian church called church of the savior so just to as a reminder that we are you know our grounding as unitarian universalists is in christianity so those texts are um not something that we i believe they are not something that we have to give up that there are ways in which we as unitarian universalists um, can still relate to those foundational teachings um, within um, the Hebrew Bible as well as within the um, Christian texts. So for example, um, when we think about uh, Easter, when we think about new life and, and resurrection as being like springing forth um, from death is new, is life. And that's a really translatable, I feel like can be a very translatable um, teaching. And one of the really cool things about being a Unitarian Universalist is because we do have these sources. You know, I was talking about the Jewish and Christian teachings. Well, also we embrace sources of spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature, which is just like putting those two things together at springtime and with Easter and like the, the earth is coming alive again after this time of having been hibernating. And um, so there's like the earth-centered and then there's also like, yeah, re resurrection, taking that word and translating it into, you know, new life. And I think that that can be a really, really beautiful way of celebrating 
spring and bringing together many, many traditions that are foundational for us as Unitarian Universalists. Um, and also keeping in mind cultural appropriation and, you know, working on like when we are celebrating Passover, like who is leading that celebration of Passover? Um, how is, if you're having a Passover Seder, like who's invited, who's leading it, who are the people who are um, cooking the food and is, you know, just managing all of those different pieces um, is very, is very important to, to treat those things with care and intention. Right, and also remembering that the reason that Easter exists at least partially is because the early Christians uh, kind of put it on top of uh, earth-centered celebration that already existed, and similarly with Christmas. So it um, really reflects those needs, those cultural needs to celebrate certain milestones, I think. Mm -hmm. um, like there are other celebrations that happen a lot around the other times like um diwali and um uh, none no other ones are coming to mind at the moment but i know that there are a lot of them um yeah yeah well one of the things i also love about thinking around um christmas time so when i was a little girl growing up unitarian universalist i went to a church that would had a christmas eve service at nighttime and to, for me as a kid i was just like this is the coolest thing ever. There were candles lit everywhere. It was like a candlelight service. And at the end of the service, everybody, we had those little teeny white stick candles that have the little paper skirt and everybody got to hold one and we passed the flame throughout the congregation while I was singing Silent Night. Okay, I was not Christian, raised Christian. Like I didn't, you know, I, I loved the idea of celebrating the birth of babies in general, you know, and that like, Jesus was a really special person and a really like a prophet and a teacher and had so many good things to teach. So yeah, like let's celebrate the birth, even if we know it didn't really happen at this time of year. And that that's actually because Christians were like taking over like celebrations of light from pagan traditions, um, lands that they conquered and colonized. And, and knowing all of that and still growing up with like, I love singing Silent Night to candlelight. And then we will walk outside onto at night, walk out the front steps of the church and where I lived, it snowed this time of year. So we would walk out and the whole um, uh, courtyard area and um, park out inside out in front of the church building was just covered in snow and reflecting the street lamps. And then we would come out with our candles and it was just this like very special, beautiful memory. And I still, to this day, absolutely love that time. I love the, the celebrating and, and also recognizing that there are many celebrations in the, in the Northern hemisphere at this darkest time of the year that focus on bringing light, right? So candles and light of all different kinds. And, and, and it just makes sense, right? It's like a human need. There's a human need to bring light at the darkest time of year. Yeah, when I first um, became a UU, uh, the congregation that I was a, a member of had a late night Christmas Eve service. And I loved it in part because I had this tradition of the midnight mass. So you, um, you were with your family. Well, in my, in my family, we had our Christmas dinner and um, we opened family presents and then we hung around until midnight and all packed in the car and pack, got to a packed church and there was, the organ was singing and the choir was singing. And when I was old enough, I was in the choir. And so there's this really rich memory of celebrating with a bunch of other people, but a bunch of other people I knew with my religious community. And uh, there's just something really special about that. And just setting aside normal life for a moment and singing and rejoicing and remembering something that's bigger than me altogether. I think there's something really um, that, that feeds the human soul for a lot of people in those kinds of rituals. That's right. It's very spiritual. And the ritual, the ritual reenactment and coming together as a community annually for specific, around specific times of year, it has such deep meaning and goes back as long as we 
can know in time that humans have been around and gathering. Um, so we know it's such a deep human need that it goes goes back to the beginning of time as far as we know. And that's that shows me that regardless of what someone what someone's theological beliefs are, what someone believes about the, you know, how how true a specific story is about for a, a certain religious tradition at a certain time of year, regardless of whether or not a person believes in the absolute truth of that thing, they know that it has meaning, that it does have deep meaning for them. And it, that can be different meaning for different people. And as a Unitarian Universalists, we celebrate that. We celebrate that variety, that diversity, and that is what we is woven together into this beautiful tapestry of Unitarian Universalist community and faith communities. It's it's why I've um, chosen it to be my life's work. And I just I love that the beauty that comes in really honoring diversity. So um, I thought we could circle back a little bit to um, traditions uh, celebrations that may not be the typical yeah yeah like uh, Diwali like, I mentioned Diwali and Kwanzaa and Day of the Dead I mean there are a lot of mm. uh, celebrations that come from different traditions but um, they can be problematic for you congregations what are some of the guidelines that that you're aware of when when congregations are considering these kinds of celebrations? Well, so because that, because we do celebrate um, a diversity of um, cultures and religious traditions, that can potentially go in, you know, cross over into cultural appropriation and has, um, ha certainly has, and as, you know, we've, um, as, as Unitarian Universalists have um, grown and learned, it's, you know, people have started to recognize the ways in which some holiday celebrations were appropriation and so what my understanding and I don't and I just I know that I would never promote celebrating a religious holiday in my religious community that wasn't an actual like um wasn't part of the tradition of some person who was helping to lead that celebration so I think that's a really important piece of it it's like if there's a bunch of um, just, you know, you use who don't have any grounding in Judaism and they decide to have, make up their own Passover Seder and write their own Haggadah and none of them are Jewish or even have Jewish background, then it just, that just feels like appropriation to me. Um, so that, to me, that would be a, one of the, that would be like a major um, characteristic. Yeah, this cultural appropriation topic is a huge one that we could have multiple episodes about. And we would love to hear what you all have to say about this. Um, and we, But to get back to what Alan was asking us to talk about, um, maybe we, this is a good time to talk about some of the UU specific holidays like flower communion or water communion. Yes, that's right. So water communion in the fall, and then flower communion in the spring are two like pretty standard ones. Um, so let's, maybe we should go ahead and talk about those first because I think we're also probably gonna run out of time. So yeah. um, water communion, you wanna start with water communion, Carrie? Yeah, well, water communion um, in the congregations I've been part of happens towards the beginning of the church year, which the church year is kind of um, similar to the school year where it starts in the fall and ends in the spring and it's it's a way to for people to come back from whatever they've done over the summer and uh their their time apart from the congregation is symbolized in water so they bring water from somewhere that they've been or it just sim symbolizes something some part of their summer time apart and that water is uh poured into one central bowl and blessed and in my congregations that water is sterilized and filtered and um, used for child dedications which is kind of a a baptism-ish kind of uu rite of passage that's right we do that also and one of the things that we do is so that 
that water is always, um, so everyone who has been spread out and away and doing things comes back together, brings all the waters back together. So there's symbolism of like the waters are coming back together. And then the water that is sterilized is then added to the previous year's water. So there's always, the water molecules are always like, staying kind of like the the first people who did it their water molecules are mixed in with the most recent people who did it who added water to it and we do bless them before we put them together so we have this community blessing each person has their water there's a blessing and then as we sing and there's music people come up and pour them in and pour it all together and then it's all brought together and there's like a final blessing and that what some of that water then we, we also use it if someone is, um, if someone is dying and would like a blessing or if someone is sick um, as, as well as with child dedications. And then we take some of the water that same day and we walk it down to the river and we pour some back into the river, into the water cycle so that there is this understanding of like this kind of continuation of the water cycle. It's a really beautiful, beautiful thing. I mean, some some congregations, I think, take some of the water outside and pour, like, water some of the plants outside or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they've done in, in my uh, congregations. I love it. It's such a it's such a powerful symbol and such a beautiful UU-specific kind of mm-hmm. ritual. We also have the flower communion, which mm, is, yes, yes. yeah, super UU um, in, <laughs> in that way. So there was a, um, a minister in Prague named um, Minister Chapek, Norbert Chapek. And the minister, um, you know, he, he was minister in this little tiny um, congregation at the end of this Charles Bridge, at one end of the Charles Bridge. And um, it was kind of a plain congregation, um, no decorations on the wall, you know, no, nothing fancy about it at all, just very plain. And one day, one spring day when he was walking um, home after a service and he was looking at all the beautiful flowers starting to bloom and the little buds blooming out on the trees. And he just thought, you know, I, this is the kind of beauty in nature that, you know, I want to bring this kind of beauty into our um, worship services. And so the next week um, he asked everyone to bring some flower or branch or something to the service with them the ne- the following week. And everyone brought their own and put them in a one vase at the um, on the altar. And then at the end of the service, everyone went up and took a different piece out, a different flower, a different branch. Um, but mostly we use flowers and then take a different flower home with them. And it's kind of this symbolizing of um, how, how much beauty we all bring into our communal gatherings and that we all gain a little bit and change a little bit from knowing one another and being together and take a little bit of that beauty home with us. That usually happens in the spring. Um, in, in my congregation, I think traditionally, I think when Norbert Chopek did the very first flower communion, it was like June, I don't know, June 8th or June 5th or something like that. Do you do that in the spring also, Carrie? Yeah, one of my favorite things about it is just the abundance. Like um, people always bring more, not everybody, but people, some people forget, some people don't really have gardens and then some people just bring tons. So there's always this (laughs) abundance afterwards and uh, used for different meetings and- and Totally, it's like the loaves and fishes, right? Like every Sunday morning of flower (laughs) communion, I'm like, are there gonna be enough flowers? I don't know if there's gonna be enough flowers. And there's always more flowers than we need. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah, it's super special. I can't wait because flower communion is coming up soon. And unfortunately we can't do it in person this year because COVID. Um, Little little placing us in a uh, historical context right there. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Yeah. But we'll find a way to make it special anyway. And it's so meaningful, even when we do it by video, people just love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's, we've reached the end of our fourth episode and uh, thank you for being with us. We really uh, love that you're here. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at podcast at ccny.org and keep your eyes 
and ears peeled because in May we're going to have this live event and we'd love to have you there with us. That's right. Goodbye, friends. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.